Well, good morning and welcome to our first Sunday in May uh, in what has become uh, our normal for now, and that is our online worship services, which will begin in a moment. But I wanted to, to start the morning by reminding you about our 30-day challenge. Remember, we're taking one month to practice kindness, the 30-day kindness challenge. Nix the negative, practice praise, carry out one act of kindness every day and and the idea is to pick one person that maybe you're struggling with or you know needs encouragement and simply focus on them and if you do that I'm noticing that as I begin to do that it's rolling off on other people as well the other thing that I'm noticing in just the, the couple of days here is that it's also causing me to focus more on what am I doing where I'm the problem in this, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes, but uh, here's the point I want to make today, and it's the reason why I'm wearing my, uh, my, my superpower shirt today, okay? Uh, and that is, kindness really is a superpower. Uh, or maybe we could say a spirit power, but that's even better than a, than a superpower. Uh, this week, uh, on Thursdays, in my uh, Zoom classes at the high school, uh, I do an Ask Anything Day where they can ask me any question they want. I tell them, ask any question you want. Uh, I, I'll have to answer it unless I don't want to. Uh, but today, one of, the, one of the first questions that one of the students asked me was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would that be? And without having to think about it at all, I said to them, I would want kindness. I would want the superpower of kindness and, and I'm trying to challenge them along with this, this uh, kindness challenge as well. But uh, listen to this verse out of Galatians chapter 5. It's familiar to you. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit, okay, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Later on in the message, I'm going to be talking about uh, alluding to these fruits of the Spirit. Uh, but we're focusing in particularly on this idea of kindness. Um, I like what the author of the book, 30 Day uh, Kindness Challenge, said. She says it's a superpower because it makes the bullets bounce off. When we practice unconditional kindness, it allows us to keep control of our feelings and, and it takes away the other person's power to just drive us crazy. You know what it's like, you're going down the road and, and uh, somebody cuts you off and you just, uh, you know, you lose it or, or maybe a coworker, which we don't see a whole lot of now really, or a family member at home says something and at first we just want to strike out. But when we respond with kindness, it takes away um, that negative energy that's being thrown at you, it disarms the other person. When we absorb that energy, and we're capable of doing it, okay, and we give back kindness, there's not a whole lot they can do except just let it lower. It gives us also uh, superpower vision. Uh, it lets us see into the hearts and minds of other people. Philippians chapter 4 says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. You know, when we practice kindness, when we think about those things, it allows us to see where our actions are. And often, it get, helps us to see other people and where they're coming from. When we, when we get past the anger, when we get past thinking that they're coming at us and we just practice kindness back, God's kindness, the Spirit's kindness back to them, we have a chance to actually see into their hearts and let God use us in some way to encourage them. Um, kindness also breaks down barriers. You ever notice that when, when somebody's a little hostile or, or, or maybe it's even somebody who's a little apprehensive of who you are, uh, when you practice kindness towards them, it softens them to who you are. It, and it opens hearts. It, it, it allows them, when they realize that your agenda is to be kind and encouraging to them, then you begin to feel safer. You begin to feel like a person that they want to open up to at least, or at least trust in a little way, because what you're doing is you're showing the spirit, because in the end, kindness is something that flows out of a fruit of the spirit. And I want to say this too, kindness energizes you. When you reach out to somebody else and you encourage somebody else, that fuels you. Now, I don't think I'm unusual this way. I know that, you know, being around people tends to energize me a lot, but I know this, when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling discouraged, when I reach out to somebody else and I'm kind to someone else, that lifts my spirits and my emotions as well. 
But I have to warn you as we get into this kindness challenge, it takes a heroic sacrifice to be kind. In order to be kind to somebody, we have to give up ourselves for them. That's the piece that's here. We'll talk more about that in the message this morning. Uh, but I want to welcome you to the service, and let's have a word of prayer. Um, we'll have a little bit of music, and then uh, we'll jump into the message this morning. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us through another week. Lord, I pray for each one who's watching this service and, and will be watching this message today that, uh, and throughout the week that you will open our hearts to you. God, we admit to you that we need your spirit working inside of us if we're going to exhibit your kindness to others. God, we, we really do want to live right side up in this upside down world. Thank you for the power and grace that you give us to live. Use this time together, Lord. Um, even though it's awkward through the screen and through all of this, I pray you'll use this time to draw us closer to each other and closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. So we'll take a break for just now and, and, and do a song together, sing a song together. Um, and then don't don't hang up too quick, okay? Because after uh, the message this morning, I'm going to share with you a really exciting announcement about how we're going to try to celebrate Mother's Day weekend together. So uh, stay with us through this and uh, in, enjoy the music, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Good morning, Church Your Family. It is an honor and a privilege to be worshiping with you this Sunday morning. We will be singing My Worth Is Not In What I Own by Keith and Kristen Getty. And I will begin with the chorus so you have an opportunity to learn it if it is a new song for you. i 
Well, I thought I would move us outside today since the weather is so nice and uh, frankly, I am really tired of that fireplace that's been behind me uh, this uh, last six, five, six weeks, however long we've been doing this. Uh, before we get started though, um, I want to tell you, you know, we're, we're kind of in this uh, unique um, time and we're not able to meet together um, and, and make connections and we thought we would do uh, a, a different kind of, uh, don't normally do this. Uh, but I thought we would do a fundraiser. So we're offering uh, what we're going to call the Spring 2020 uh, Church Preparedness Kit. Normally we would give you a discovery pack when you come into to church on Sunday morning and you head over to Fellowship Cafe. But since we can't do that, uh, we're going to offer you this, uh, this Spring 2020 uh, Church Preparedness Kit. Uh, and it's all yours uh, for whatever designated amount you want to send in. Uh, and uh, we'll send you a picture of this kit that you can put together yourself. Uh, so uh, good luck with that, and uh, in, enjoy the Spring 2020 uh, Church Preparedness Skit. We, uh, we're in our uh, second week of uh, our series, uh, Right Side Up, Living Right Side Up in an Upside Down World. Um, and I was thinking this morning, uh, literally as I woke up this morning, uh, what came to mind uh, today, uh, and I've been thinking about how, how do I want to start this, this message today, um, and this thought came to me, I don't know if it was from me or the Lord, I'm going to think it's from the Lord, uh, and here was the thought, because it, this is a truly biblical thought, and here it is, what happens on the inside is what changes the outside, let me say that again, what happens on the inside is what changes the outside, as I said a moment ago, I really believe that is a true biblical perspective because the Bible repeats that principle over and over again. In Proverbs 23, it says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's the old King James Version. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart. Uh, Romans 12 tells us to renew our minds. Uh, in Psalm 51, the psalmist cries out to God, God, create in me a clean heart. We see this principle over and over again in Scripture that uh, what changes our outside is what happens on the inside first. And, and I share that because, again, we're all kind of stuck inside right now. Uh, we, we, run, we run a few errands. We do a few things as we go along the way. But... Um, we're pretty much stuck inside and we're looking forward to getting outside uh, to some semblance of, of normal, or as one pastor calls it, uh, the new normal. We're looking forward to the normal. We're not looking back uh, to the normal. Um, and I'm wondering, <clears throat> are we actually working on the inside while we're waiting to get outside? That ties into the other question that I had prepared to share this morning, and that is, what will your life be like when this, this lock-in, this stay-at-home, this stay-in is over? Um, and, and I'm wondering, again, I've been thinking a lot this week, um, are we allowing this inside time to go wasted? We've always talked about, ah, oh, wouldn't it be so great if we could spend you know, more time at home and not have to get out? And, and now after five or six weeks, honestly, I've lost count. Um, we're all wanting to get out of this, but are we using this time now that God has given us? And, and I believe God has given this to us, even though a lot of what's happening is a result of, of, of things beyond our control. I believe God's given this to us as a time to work in our own lives. 
And, and while we're looking forward to a lot of things when we get to go out, wondering what we're doing to change what's inside us right now as well. So let me ask that question again. How will your life be different when this stay in, when this, uh, this lock in is over? We're uh, again in our second week of this new series, uh, Living Right Side Up in an Upside Down World. And, and our thought has been, what do we need to flip in order uh, to start living right side up? And, and last week we talked about flipping our wins, you know, W-H-E-N to nows. Uh, we talked about changing, flipping our intentions into actions. And I hope you've been doing that this week. And, and, and mainly that we literally turn or flip our whole heart back to Jesus Christ, back to God. Uh, but today I, I want to come back to that point that we left off with last week, flipping our heart. And I want to go over to Ephesians chapter 4, and I want us to delve into a few verses at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 4, um, because they deal with the heart attitude. This, if, if we change the inside, the outside changes. And as I said a minute ago, what happens on the inside is what's going to change the outside. Ephesians chapter 4. What's interesting about Ephesians chapter 4 to me too is that when the Apostle Paul wrote this, he was on lockdown. <laughs> he was locked in. He was in a prison, and while he was in that prison, instead of sitting there moping, instead of complaining that there wasn't somebody there to minister to him, um, he was busy writing letters and ministering and encouraging other people outside that prison, outside himself. And, and one of those letters that he wrote was to a church that was in Ephesus. And as he writes them, um, he gives a lot of doctrinal information, but then he gets to chapter 4, and as, as most of the Apostle Paul's letters are written, he first teaches, and then he, he challenges. And so in the challenge section uh, of Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians chapter 4, here's what he says. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner of the Lord... He was locked up. We sort of feel that way now. Okay, we're not in prison, that's for sure, but it sure feels like we're locked in. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Uh, that's uh, what I would say is right-side living in an upside-down world. Um, what does he mean when he says calling there? Now, some people would say that's talking about one's vocation. Uh, but I don't think that's the perspective there. I think what he's talking about there is the fact that God called you to salvation. And God, you know, Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, that all come to repentance. And God is constantly calling people to him. And God called you. And if you are a Christ follower, if you're not, stay with us because we're going to come back to that point. But if you are a Christ follower, God called you, and now he's asking you to walk worthy, to walk right side up, walk, walk right in the way that he called you to his salvation. So the idea is, is that we need to live outside what he's already done inside in our life. Now, our problem is, though, is that whether he's called us or not, and he has, once he's called us and we've accepted that, that calling, we still find ourselves sometimes living outside the wrong way. And God wants us to take what he's done inside and move it to the outside. Walk worthy of your calling. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. But as soon as he does that, he shifts immediately to the fruits of the Spirit. What's interesting about this passage uh, in, in um, Ephesians chapter 4 is that it sounds very familiar if you start looking at the words there to another letter that he wrote to a church in Galatia, the churches in Galatia. Um, Galatians chapter 5, uh, there's a passage there that we call the fruits of the Spirit. And as he goes through those, he ca talks about whether the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faith. We go through all of that. But if you look at the passage we're about to read, Paul is going to either mention directly or infer indirectly all nine fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5. He's going to mention them here in Ephesians chapter 4 of how we're going to walk worthy. 
And so here's the point. God wants what he's doing inside us to show outside. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's a work on the inside that happens on the outside. What is a fruit? A fruit is a natural result of growth. Uh, I've got an apple tree that I'm staring at right now over there uh, behind the camera, uh, and there's buds on it, but before very long, there's going to be little apples on there. And those apples, while they're growing on the outside limbs, edges of the limbs of this tree, are happening because of something that's going on inside that tree. When a, when a plant or a tree produces fruit, it does so because of the work on the inside. Healthy plants, healthy trees, they, they grow to produce fruit. That's the purpose of a plant or a tree, is to grow fruit that reproduces. Well, if that's true of healthy plants, it's even more true of healthy Christians. Healthy Christians grow in their walk with Christ. But that growth, that, that fruit that is produced because of their growth is not a result of what they do. It's a result of allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work in them. So maybe it is something that we do, but what we do is we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We cooperate with God and allow Him to work this fruit through us. It's walking worthy is on the outside should be what's happening on the inside, right side living in an upside down world. He's calling us to live out God's fruit in our lives, which is, is right where we're going as, as we begin in the next verse. So he says again in verse number one, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then in verse number two, he says this. Let's just read the next two verses. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And, and here's the thing. This, 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 we have to understand this is all a work of the Holy Spirit. He mentions humbleness. He mentions gentleness, patience, love, uh, peace. All of those are fruits of the Spirit. They're a result of the Spirit, us cooperating with God working in our life, but this is what God does. It's God's spirit. And, and you can't have these fruits in your life without God working in your life. And if you don't have God's spirit living in you, um, it's going to be futile to try to demonstrate what he said here, to be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love, make every effort to, uh, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. If you don't have God's spirit living inside, you will never truly have these fruits on the outside. And, and stay with me because we'll come back to that at the end of the message. If you're sitting here saying, man, I don't have that and I want that. We're going to come back to that. But let me read the rest of this again. I'm going to start at the beginning. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he adds this. There is one body and one Spirit just as you were called in one hope when you were called. There's that calling God's asking you to come to him. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of one of us is given grace, or, but to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. There's that word grace now, God giving us what? His fruits, his gifts. Why? Because we are called and we are to live out. We're to walk worthy of that calling. We're to walk worthy of what God put inside us. We're to live it outside. We're to live right side up in this upside down world. And as I said a moment ago, uh, these are all the fruits of the Spirit. And the thing is, is that these fruits are the opposite of the way the world lives. We could say this, the world lives opposite of these fruits of the Spirit, and they live in a way so opposite that it is a pandemic proportions. Forgive the, uh, the pun there or the illusion. And, and I, I was thinking about that as I was preparing this part of the message, that these fruits of the Spirit can only happen when God works in us, because um, apart from the Holy Spirit, we try to have these things in our life. I mean, think about it this way. Uh, the Bible talks about self-control. What does the world talk about? We talk about dieting and 12 steps and 
Then there's those guys at the gym that we all hate. It's the reason I don't go to the gym anymore. At least that's the excuse I'm making. Uh, you know, uh, they all talk about self-control, but you can only maintain that for so long on your own. And then you, you fall. Gentleness. So we, we live in a culture that doesn't want gentleness. We live in a power culture. Everything's about power. Gentleness, we said. Patience. Uh, we, we always seem to be in a hurry. Our, our idea of patience is uh, more impatience. We're stressed. Most of our stress comes because we're focused on other people and we're impatient. Humbleness is, uh, humble is not a thing that's popular in our culture today. And when we find it, it, it impresses us, but we don't. I mean, we're, we're more interested in the likes and the followers that we have on social media and how many people, uh, you know, pay attention to our TikTok video uh, than, than actually being, being what the Bible says is humble. And peace, man, how are we going to gain peace when we live in a world and we look around us, everything is unsettled. So lots of unrest everywhere. We talk about peace, but it's not something that's so easily grasped. I think that's why uh, it, he ends this passage that we just looked at, or the middle of this passage we looked at, by saying, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But again, I, I want to kind of come back. Um, stay with me. It's a long introduction. Um, right side living in an upside down world. What if we flipped all of what if we walked out of this lock-in as the Apostle Paul says here in verse 3, striving or fighting for peace? What if we walked out of this lock-in, this stay-in? What, what, what if, our, our, you know, um, we walked out of this challenge that we're faced with right now with this, this pandemic? What if we walked out of all of this as peace warriors? Peace warriors. Now you're thinking, hey, Pastor, that's, that seems a contradiction, doesn't it? And, and I want to say this, it's not a bit of a contradiction, it's a huge contradiction, okay? Uh, but it's exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling us, okay? You know, we, we can't wait for all of this stuff that we're going through to be over. Because the truth is, is that there's always going to be something that we're going through. The change needs to happen now. The change needs to happen now so that what God is doing inside us and make no mistake, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a believer, God's working inside you whether you're fighting it or not. But he wants it to come out of you as well. It's back to the, the first point we made last week when we talked about those three flips. It's from when to now. Okay? And God wants to do, not, not, he, God doesn't want us to wait until when. He wants us to see what we're going to do now. So what if we were determined to live inside what needs to be lived outside. Because honestly, if, if you change your inside, you let God change your inside, and you cooperate with him, you're going to see the outside change. You may have already noticed it this week if you started the kindness challenge. Because as you focus on being, you know, nix the negative, practice praise, carry out kindness. If you begin to do those things in your life, you're going to notice that it doesn't just change your attitudes or your actions towards one person. It's going to begin to reflect other areas as well because you're, you're changing the inside to affect the outside. You're allowing God to do that. What if we determine to live inside what needs to be lived outside? Maybe another way to say that is instead of just fighting, uh, we need to be fighting for peace. Instead of fighting each other, we're fighting for peace. God calls us to live right side up in an upside down world. So here are three flips. We started this last week. Three flips that I believe we can make inside our hearts, inside ourselves, that will change our outside as well. And I think if we focus on inside, and, and now let me shift that a little bit, what if we focus inside our homes, and what we do inside our homes changes what we're going to do outside our homes when we come out of this whole thing that we're into now. So let's go back to the passage and let's look at that. Flip number one. We need to flip from self-focused to others-focused. We need to flip from self to others and, and I think Paul puts the hardest one first. And I, maybe that's just because it's the hardest for me. And as you've heard me say before, I'm just a selfish little booger. I find myself 
worried about myself and my concerns and my needs and my ideas, my feelings before anybody else. Notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 again. Be completely humble and gentle. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking what I'm thinking. This one's easy because of, humble, if, of all the people in the world, I'm the humblest person I know. Oh, it's hard to be humble. You're perfect in every way. Can't wait to look in the mirror. I can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. Get better looking each day. To know me is to what? To know me. I love me some Mac Davis. <laughs> I think that ages me a little bit too, probably. Um, uh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. Um, you know, okay, let's get back to the point here. Uh, the, the idea here is be humble. Humble uh, can be defined as um, lowliness of mind. Interesting, the Greek word there uh, for humble uh, is the idea of literally groveling. I, I use the term in my own life to eat dirt. Man, sometimes I just have to eat dirt, um, you know, before somebody. Um, and, and it wasn't a good term. It was a term used of, of slaves and how slaves were to respond to their masters. But when the New Testament takes this word and talks about humility, talks about being humble, it flips the word. It changes it from a... Um, humiliating and there's a difference between humbleness and humility or humiliating okay humiliating is what happens outside into you uh, being humble is what happens inside going out and so the, the scripture flips it from a from an external force coming in to an internal source going out it makes it a positive attitude it's the idea there of having a true sense of self it's not that I think less of myself, because frankly, that most of us, <laughs> that's never going to be an issue. It's the issue of focusing more on not me, but them. It's a, a true perspective of who I am. Because typically what gets me into trouble, and, and maybe you as well, is I get to thinking more of myself than I do of someone else. Be completely humble, completely humble. That means when, when I walk into the room, instead of immediately starting on what I want to say, instead of immediately starting on what I want to happen, instead of immediately going for the problem that I have, the concern I have, the first thing I do is practice praise. Okay? I'm not going to say negative. I'm not going to start. Nix the negative, okay? I'm not going to start there. I'm going to practice praise. It's the idea that what if when you walked into a room, no matter who was there, the first thing you said was something encouraging about that person, or at least one of the people in that room. Nix the negative, of course. Don't go negative on that. But what if, if what you did was to be encouraging there? Be completely humble, internal. And then he goes on and says this, not just be completely humble, but he says com completely humble and gentle. Gentleness is the idea of accepting what's happening to us. This is accepting God's dealings with us. Uh, I've used this illustration over and over again to describe what the Greek word for humble means. Um, and it means the idea of gentleness under control, or strength, excuse me, under control. Picture a large, large, strong horse with a rider on that horse who's a lot, weighs a lot less, um, it may have a lot of power, that rider, but it doesn't have near the strength that that horse has. But yet that horse stops, starts, goes, turns, wherever, according to the rider. Why? Because the rider has the reins. The rider has the bridle in the horse's mouth. And the horse submits its strength to the rider. And as I thought about that, you know, I've always thought about strength under control, but... Um, it's, it's also the idea of that horse has gotten to a point where it accepts the direction, the leading, the dealing of the rider, the one who's controlling the reins. It's, the horse has come to accept that. 
maybe you've seen uh, uh, on Western movies where, uh, you know, there's, they've gathered all the horses and the cowboy's going to get on the horse and he's going to, quote, break the horse. And he doesn't try to get rid of the horse's strength. What he does is he tries to get the horse to submit enough that it'll listen to the rider. And then with the rider and the horse together, their power and strength working together creates something even better. Well, that's what God wants to do when he says there to be humble and then to be gentle. It, it, it's allowing ourselves, submitting ourselves to God's direction in our life. And it's not submitting from a, a point of being humiliated. It's the issue of submitting to God's direction so that we become better and focused and directed. Again, who better than God? You know, humble yourselves, be completely humble, and then be gentle. Now, how do I reflect God's direction in my life? How do I, um, how do you, how do we um, reflect the fact that we are submitting to God's direction in our life? How does that work out? Can, can I just make the obvious statement here? We do so, it's reflected uh, by how we deal with others. Your gentleness in relationship to God, accepting his dealing in your life, will be reflected by how we deal with others and how we respond to them. Are you reacting to the people around you right now or are you responding to those people around you? And a lot of it comes to how are you accepting their dealings towards you? You want to know if you're gentle or not? How are you responding to what people in your home, let's just start there, say and do and act when you see them? Gentleness is allowing yourself to accept what's happening, okay? That doesn't mean you're, you're humiliated. It means you're willing to say, I'm willing to be gentle. Much like that horse, God, I'm allowing God to lead me, even if at times he's leading me through other people. So we have to learn to flip from self to others. It doesn't get rid of ourselves. It makes us better selves when we begin to allow God to work in our life, we're humble. We put ourselves in perspective of other people. We focus on them, and then we're learning to uh, accept God's dealings towards us, whether it's directly through him or it's him working towards us through other people as well. And before I go on to the next point, i got to tell you that's one of the hardest things that we're going to learn, and that is that we have to learn to accept that often God works through other people. Even people we don't like, often through people that we don't think they're even doing godly things. But we have to remember Romans 8, God works all things together for the good of those who love him. Okay, all things together for good to those who love him. Doesn't mean those things are good. It doesn't even mean they're good, that person or whatever. But it does mean that God can use those things to work in our life. We just have to be willing to be humble and gentle towards him. And then... What Paul's telling, saying here is humble and gentle towards others, outside in. Because see, both of these are inward qualities that are reflected outwardly. I, um, I have a small work area in the corner of, of our den uh, that is my office. Um, and it's, it's kind of a corner and it's dark in that corner. So I needed to get a lamp. Uh, that would help me and, and I got the best lamp that I thought I could get and it was very frustrating because even with that lamp It still felt dark and shady in that corner uh, I even tried changing the light, but when I changed the light It just became a big kind of a glare and that didn't help as well but Then a couple of weeks ago. I had this thought What if I turned the lamp away from me and pointed it towards the wall? And when I did that, instead of getting the direct light, I'm getting the reflected light off the wall. And man, it has made a difference in how I'm sitting in that room. And I got to thinking about that reflection. That's what God wants to do with us. He wants us to reflect him. He wants us to reflect him off of us towards others. And that's what humbleness and gentleness is end up being. It is a reflection of God working in us outward as well. We, we want to be not like the lamp, we want to be like the wall reflecting the light back. We need to flip from being 
self-focus to other focus. But then he goes on from there, takes it a, a little bit farther. Well, before I do that, the question is, what is that going to look like? I mean, maybe I need to uh, um, slow down a little bit here. And we need to ask, what does it look like when we, um, when we learn to be humble, when we learn to be gentle toward, toward those around us? Well, it reminds me of these two quarters that I have in my hand. You see those right there? See that? Those are tight quarters. <laughs> you see, we're all living in tight quarters right now. And uh, because of that, there's a lot of opportunities to practice this humbleness, uh, this gentleness in our life. Because honestly, we get frustrated at the people around us. Don't tell me you don't, uh, because we do. And, and, it, and often it's little, but when we're in close quarters like this over a long period of time, those things begin to add up or those things begin to be magnified. And I, I found that of me this week as well. That towards the end of the week, and I, I think this is kind of the first time in, in all of this stuff that's been going on, I told a co-worker uh, from school this week uh, that there was one day, which just it was one day, I just had it. It's like I, I was just through with all of this. And, and I was very frustrated. And in the process of that, I, I, I struck out at other people. Uh, verbally, not not physically, but uh, twice this week at least, at least two that I'm aware of, my family would probably say maybe more, but two that I was fully aware of, where um, somebody said something, and, and honestly, it wasn't a bad thing that they said. Um, it just, I wasn't, I just wasn't there. I just, I had had enough. And, and, and even in, in both cases, honestly, I think the persons were trying to encourage me, but I'd had enough, and I struck out at them. Uh, you know, and, 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 it, and it wasn't good. Um, and, and, you know, what it was is that I, I wasn't humble. I, 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 I have to remind myself that, that um, I'm no better. I don't, I don't, forget the worst part. I'm no better than that person that's speaking to me. I'm no better than that person that's trying to share with me or challenge me or, or educate me or what. I'm no better than that. And I really do not have the right to assume I'm better than them and shut them off. I have to learn to be humble. When, when something happens to you, you have to be reminded, you're no better. Humbleness is saying, I'm no better. I'm no better. And I can put them first. God, God was better than us, and he humbled himself. Lower than us on the cross. To receive our, so if Jesus can do that, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, we can learn to be humble. And, and then the gentleness side is that uh, I have no right to use the force of my will against someone else. I have no right to do that. Now, parents, I realize when we're raising little kids, that can be a different situation, but well, typically we're not talking about that. We're talking about dealing with, you know, with, with other adults or other older, older children. I have no right to use the full force of my strength, okay, verbally, emotionally, how, physically, anyway, against someone else. I have no right to do that. This is not about self-protection or self-preservation. This is about ministering and encouraging and lifting up others. I, I, I have to learn gentleness. I have to learn strength under control. I have to learn to say, God, let me use the strength, the restraint that you're building in me to show outwardly. And I have to realize that I can't do that if I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to work in me. So chase a rabbit here for a second. Sometimes when we're like this, we're like this because of what I just described, when we're like that. When we're like that, it's because... I, I think probably it's God, again, that red light we talked about last week, that warning light. It's, it's God reminding us, hey, you need to let the Holy Spirit work inside you. You need to be working hard to connect more with God and the Holy Spirit inside you so that you can see this on the outside. We need to flip from selfishness, self-focus to others. But then second, and I think if we get the first one down, then we can get to this next one. And that is we need to flip from irritable to appreciation. We need to flip irritability to appreciation. Ouch. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Have you found yourself a little more irritable these days? From irritable to appreciation. And I think this is a big one. This is a big key here. 
I, th I think when we work on this one, uh, the Apostle Paul shares a very, listen to this. Back to verse number two. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now that's just a short phrase. In the English, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, it's eight words. In the Greek, there's three key words there. The first key word there, I'm not going to go into the Greek there as far as pronouncing it, but the first word there is patient. Patient is an interesting word because it comes from two words in the Greek that means long passion. Or even, even, even deeper than that, a long anger. The word anger there is, is, is thymus, like the thymus gland that's inside us. Whole another story for that. I'll share another day. Um, but it, it was where the Greeks thought that the, the center of anger came from. Just right that burning right there in the middle. And, and so it was a word for anger, but it also came to mean uh, when you put these two words together, long, it's long in anger. Not staying angry, but long before you allowed the anger to take over in your life. That's the idea, idea of being patient. What is patient? Patient is when you don't get angry. Seriously, when you lose your patience, you're really, you're getting angry, aren't you? He says there, be patient, be long in anger. Be long before you get angry. But how do you do that? Well, be patient, how do you do it? Bearing with, bearing with. The word there means literally to be tolerant. Not, not tolerant from the perspective that culture wants to say we, we accept sin, but it does mean we accept the other person. Um, it means to stay to the finish. It means sometimes somebody may be going through something that you know fully is the wrong thing to be doing. Or you may think it's wrong because you don't like it, I, whatever perspective that is. But bearing with one another means that we're tolerant. We're staying with them till the finish. We're loving them. We're not getting angry. We're going to stay with them through the finish doesn't mean we don't gently and humbly try to encourage them through this. It means we don't strike out back to the first point, okay? But we, we learn here not to get irritated, not to be irritable. You, you know what that's like. You'll, you'll have some days where it doesn't matter how they look at you. It looks like they're, you know, whatever they do, you assume it's bad. I love, we shared years ago in a series, we talked about, uh, you know, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Instead of immediately going to the worst in what we assume is their attitude or their motivation behind it, we give them the most positive motivation we can give them. We, we, we are slow to anger. We're patient. We're bearing. We, we're tolerant. We stay with them and help them through the... We, we take this out, and honestly, think about this. A lot of the arguments, just think about an argument or two that you've been in this last week or two. <laughs> maybe one or two, maybe more. What if you had stayed with it all the way through to the end? Being tolerant. But here's the key. Be patient, bearing with one another, and then it says, in love. Now, let's be careful here because when we see the word love there, we think, oh, I love what they're doing. That's not what it's saying. The word love there is agape. And again, you've heard me teach this over and over again. The idea of agape has to do with value. Agape love, this God love that we call it. Agape was a very basic word that, again, was given a highly exalted perspective in the New Testament because it speaks of God's love. But it's the idea of placing value into something and then loving it because of the value that you've placed into it. Again, remember back, I don't care if it's a baseball card, it's Beanie Babies, uh, that ring that you're wearing that symbolizes your marriage that you might be able to get a few hundred or a few thousand dollars for. For somebody else, it's just a piece of gold and a stone. But for you, it's invaluable. It's priceless. Why? Because you have put value in that. We all have things that we value. Now let me read this verse again. Be patient. Be long before you're angry. Hang on, then bear, stay through to the end. That's impossible, Pastor Paul. That's impossible, Apostle Paul that wrote this. God, this is impossible. How can I do that? Well, you do it because you value something. See, if you have something of value and it has a flaw in it, you don't look at the flaw. You look at the value. 
Um, I'm told that every diamond has a flaw in it somewhere. It doesn't make the, val the diamond less precious. Sometimes that flaw makes it very unique, gives it a special look. Sometimes it's the flaw in it that makes it most valuable. Uh, just thinking about that just now, there, uh, I don't collect coins, but I know some people that do, and there are some rare valuable coins out there in the world. And Sometimes they're valuable because there's only one or two of a kind, but sometimes the reason there's only one or two of a kind is because there's a flaw. There's a misprint in the, in, in the bill or in the coin, and that's what makes it valuable is because it's a, it's a rarity. It's a one of a kind. What if we flipped from being irritable to appreciation. If we began to appreciate even the flaws in the other person uh, because we knew that those flaws were the very things that made them unique in who they are, I think we'd be less irritable. I tell couples all the time, the thing that drew you to the one you love the most is probably the thing that drives you the craziest now. You know, the, the old idea was I loved him because he was a strong, silent type, but now that I'm married, he'll never talk to me. You know, that kind of idea. Uh, what if we started looking at the, the things that irritate us as the unique things in that person that God wants us to appreciate the most? We need to flip from being selfish, self-focused to others-focused. We need to flip from being irritable to appreciative. And then finally, we need to flip from fighting to peace. And I've gone way too long, so let me go through this quickly. If you're going to fight for anything, fight for peace. I know that sounds like a contradiction. In verse number three, he says this, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Uh, make every effort. It's the idea to be diligent, to hurry up. It's the same word that's used in, in 2 Timothy chapter four, where he says, I fought a good fight. The word fought there, the idea of being diligent, okay, hurrying up. Um, it means to strive. Uh, can I say it this way? Maybe the Newell translation would be, go out there and break a sweat, fight for it. Put enough energy into it that you feel it, that you're, you're breaking a sweat for this. You know, uh, we don't do a good job putting all of our energy into working for peace. Instead, we, we fight to get our perspective instead of fighting for peace. And I know that sounds like a contradiction, but if you're going to fight for anything, if you're going to strive, if you're going to put your energy into anything, put it in to striving for peace. Now, how do you do that? He says, make every effort to keep. The word keep there is the idea to guard. To guard something that you have in your possession. You can't guard something that you don't possess. Okay, uh, You're guarding something that you have. Okay, what, but what, what do we have? He says there to guard what? The unity. There's a unity that the God's Spirit has given us. Okay, Not uniformity. Unity. There's a difference. Unity means can be, we can do different things in the same direction. As a family, in our home, as a church, uh, as, as friends, however, wherever God puts us in this, we can be doing okay, different things in the same direction because we have the same destination. We're going on the same journey towards what God is doing in our lives. So we want to do everything we can. We want to strive. We want to fight okay, to keep the unity of the Spirit, okay, it's the Holy Spirit, again, working inside us, it's that fruit of the Spirit working inside us, that the power of the Holy Spirit that's working inside us, we need to stop fighting against what the Holy Spirit is doing in our life, and start fighting with Him, start using all of our effort with Him, to keep the unity of the Spirit, and then he says here, in the bond of peace, the glue that hold us, holds us together is peace. It's interesting that the one thing that we should be fighting for is the thing that we fight the most against, and it's the one thing that will glue us together. You know, forget flattening the curve when it comes to, you know, this pandemic. We should be flattening the stress and the conflict in our homes. We need to flip from self to others. We need to flip irritability to appreciation. We need to flip strife for peace. Fight for peace <laughs> instead of fighting each other. So how do we do that? Let me give you a couple of practical ideas, and these are really basic. Number one, start praying together with those around you. 
those of you in, that are in your home, your family, start praying with them. I know it may seem awkward. Just start with a short list. Go around the group, whether it's two of you or more, and just say, everybody, what's one thing we're going to pray for? And then everybody take a turn praying for that one thing. Read God's Word together. Maybe start in the book of Ephesians that we're looking at right now. Read the Bible together. Uh, if you need a way, a plan to do that, again, you version's got all sorts of them. Go back there. And then here's one that I want to remind you about. Watch what's something real. You know, we may be spending a lot of time in front of media these days, but we're looking at a lot of things that either aren't real or are fighting against us. And it's just filling us with all of that tension and stuff. What if we started watching things that were real? If you're not going to read scripture together, why not watch good things together? And this reminds me to bring back the idea of Right Now Media, which we'll talk about in a minute again. If you do not have Right Now Media, it's free through our church. And all you have to do is email me and say, hey, let me know about Right Now Media, and I will send you an invitation where you can have loads of material uh, to watch with your family, encouraging Bible-based material that you can uh, use with your family and yourself. And it comes back to the idea, of, again, of this week's kindness challenge. Nix the negative, practice praise, carry out kindness. All of those things to flip from inside and allow it to come outside your life. Now, I said back a few minutes ago, a while ago when we started this message, that all of this works only when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. And if, and if you're here and you have not have not allowed the Holy Spirit into your life. That's the beginning place. You've got to come to a point where you say, God, I submit to who you are. It's as easy as A, B, C. Number one, admit you need God. Admit you need Him. I'm a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of God's standard, God's glorious standard. I need God. Admit you need Him, that you can't do this on your own. B, believe. Believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he came to this earth, lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for your sin and for mine. Believe. And then believe that he rose again from the dead to prove that he has power over sin and death. And then finally, see, confess. Simply come to God and say, God, I confess that I need you in my life. I confess that I want you to be the boss, the Lord of my life. I receive your gift of salvation. What you are outside here around me, I now want you to come and live inside me. And the Bible says whoever calls upon his name, he will save. In this time right now, you can open your life and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray together. If you're here today and you say, man, Pastor Paul, I'm ready to receive God's gift of salvation. I understand it's as simple as ABC, admit, believe, confess. And I'm willing to do that now. Then in, in this time, in the quietness of your heart, and you're probably in a place right now you could do it out loud and not be embarrassed. Just simply pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I need you. I've sinned and I can't save myself. So I accept, I receive your offer of forgiveness and eternal life. I make you the boss, the Lord of my life. May I may not understand everything. I know that's what I desire. And I'm opening up my life to you. And if you pray that prayer and you truly mean it, you can also say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving me your eternal life. Thank you for saving me from myself and my sin. God, thank you for the gift of eternal life in Jesus name and if you're here and you say pastor I've already made that decision but man I want to see God flip these things in my life why not just simply say God I today in this moment want to begin to cooperate more with what you're doing in my life thank you for the salvation you've given me but now I want to begin to cooperate with what you're doing in my life Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time we have together today. In your powerful, precious name we pray. Amen. 
Now we're going to take a, a, a short, just a short blackout break and come back and I'm going to share a couple of announcements uh, with my church family, with the church family. But hang on because we've got a special Mother's Day announcement that I want to share with you in just a moment. Okay, I, I've already gone way too long today um, in this, so I'll kind of go quick with the announcements, but I want to thank you for being here today, church family. Uh, it looks like we are at least now extended out to the middle of May. I got a notice from the Grange, the uh, Parks and Rec, that according to what's going on in the state, unless something changes, uh, we're going to be um, back in this mode at least through the middle of June, and I don't know what that's going to do to movies under the stars at this point, but for that outreach... Uh, but let's continue to pray, and we want to find some ways to begin to connect uh, in a way that is appropriate, in a way that um, fits with uh, what we're being asked to do, because we want to be respectful of our government and all of that, and we want to be safe for everyone involved with this. So just be praying. Uh, I want to encourage you to continue to give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. God has been providing uh, the needs that we have as a church right now, but we want to continue to do that. But even beyond the needs that we have as a church, you and I have a need to put God first. So as God provides for you, be sure and give him first. There's an inside challenge that can work outside. God, I'm going to put you first, even when it's hard, even when it's a stress during this time period. I'm going to put you first, and I'm going to demonstrate it through my finances. So I want you to continue to give your tithes and offerings. Uh, you can go to churchforfamily.com slash giving, and all the information is there about all the different ways you can give, including uh, mailing your tithes and offerings in and doing things online electronically. So that's all there. Um, also, uh, I want to encourage you, we've set up an online connection card. And if you're here and you've made a commitment to Christ today, we'd love for you to share that by emailing uh, to us and letting us know that you've accepted Christ. But, but any other need that you have, anything you want to share, go online, fill out the connection in the electronic connection card. That information will get to me and we'll share it to those who are appropriate. If you have a need in your life, uh, right now in your family. Please share with us. If we can help, we want to be able to help. But if not, we want to connect with others who can help. So please, please let us know what's going on. Keep us informed with that. Now, let me share with you uh, the exciting... Uh, Terry and I were talking this week, and I was talking to a couple other leaders in the church, and we've got this idea. And here's what we want to do, and we think we can do this safely, and we can do this. We're thinking about how we want to honor our mothers, even though we're not able to get together. And you know, we have traditions on Mother's Day at Church for Family. So here's what we're going to do this, this, uh, this Mother's Day weekend. On Saturday, um, Church for Family is going to offer Mother's Day portraits. Uh, you and, and your family members that are with you uh, can have a legitimate uh, family portrait done uh, by a professional photographer. We brought Joy Lynn, uh, my daughter, back in who is a professional photographer. She works for several uh, companies in uh, the Los Angeles area, magazines and otherwise. Does a lot of fashion photography actually. Uh, but anyway, she's going to be here with us uh, Mother's Day weekend and she's going to be taking uh, family portraits. And here's how we're going to do this. We're going to do them at our home. Uh, some of you know where we live. If not, we'll give you that information in a minute. Um, but we're going to invite you to come over with a family, with your family, and have a family portrait done uh, here on the property here at uh, the parsonage, you know, home that we live in over here. Um, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to have you come as in a car load, and uh, you will set up a specific time for you to come. Uh, the way our property is set up, you literally can drive in one gate into the, our back end of our property where the orchards and the fruit trees are, and uh, you'll be able to get out as a family unit, uh, have your picture taken. Again, we're going to handle all the social distancing issues and, and all of that. Uh, bring your masks and all that stuff, you know, to wear until your picture's taken. But we're going to do it in a very safe, conscientious way, one family at a time. You'll be able to get out. Uh, have your, your, your pictures taken, and then we'll have a gift for each of the moms that, that come, um, and then you'll be able to get back in your car and drive out, and uh, everything will be fine, and then the next family will be able to come in. So that's kind of how we're going to do that. Uh, but in order to make that happen, if you wish to have your portrait taken with your family, or just yourself for that matter, uh, if, you, if you wish to have that done, then we need you to email us at the email address that you've seen here at the bottom in the, in the Mother's Day Chiron at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you need to email us, okay, and let us know. Give us your name, 
um, your phone number, even if we already have it, give us your name and phone number again, first and last name, phone number. Uh, give us an idea of how many you think would probably be in your family when you have that picture taken, just so we know. And then as soon as we get that, within uh, the first you know, day or two of this week, we will get a hold of you by phone and we will set up a specific time for you to come and have your picture taken with your family and pick up a Mother's Day packet gift from Church for Family uh, for you and your mom. And uh, this is for uh, if you are a regular member of our church and you come all the time. Maybe you've never come and you've just started watching us online during this time. Hey, we would love to have you come and have your picture taken and meet you. You just send us an email, let us know who you are, give us your, your name, uh, your your phone number and how many you think would be in your in your picture and we'll get together with you and we'll work out the arrangements for that this is going to happen on Saturday we're going to do the photos on Saturday morning from 10 o'clock to noon during that time frame from 10 o'clock until noon on Saturday morning we're going to be working on these photos uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that you can um, Again, if you're interested, uh, email us, let us know, reserve your time, church for family, okay, at gmail.com. Uh, put Mother's Day or photo or something like that uh, in the, um, you know, in, in the title line there. Uh, and I, th I think it's going to be kind of a neat way for us to be able to share. And again, we'll not only have your photo taken, but we're going to have a special gift for all of our mothers uh, that are able to come. Uh, and, and be a part of that. So uh, that's our, our Mother's Day this year. Join us next week because hopefully we'll have a special, we'll be working on a special Mother's Day service uh, where we can enjoy this online. Thank you for being with us. I know I've kept you a little bit longer today than we have the last few weeks. Um, but uh, enjoy your week. Uh, moms, happy almost Mother's Day. Family, don't forget, next week is Mother's Day and now's the time to start working on that. Uh, but today is the Lord's Day. Remember, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Uh, have a blessed day, and uh, we'll see you next week. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Nix the negativity. Practice kindness. Carry out our practice praise, excuse me. Carry out kindness. And we will see you next week online or throughout this week, hopefully. We'll see you this Saturday having your picture taken. Uh, but we'll see you next week online at churchforfamily.com. Lord bless you.